Hello and welcome to Let's Talk, an award-winning series of podcasts produced and delivered by the Hazelden Betty Ford Foundation. Each podcast focuses on a topic related to addiction to alcohol and other drugs, from prevention, research, treatment, current events, advocacy, and of course, recovery from addiction to alcohol and other drugs. I'm your host, William Moyers, and today joining us is Dr. Marvin Seppala, the Chief Medical Officer of the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation. Welcome, Marv. Thanks a lot, William. Good to be here. Nice to have you with us again here at the Betty Ford Center on this podcast. And it's, I think, rather appropriate that our topic for today is talking about the collaboration with the Mayo Clinic on a couple of studies, which I want you to talk about. But I think it's interesting that um, this collaboration is with Mayo Clinic, and that's where a lot of your um, story comes from. It sure does. I was... I got sober while I was working at the Mayo Clinic after high school, actually before I graduated from high school because I dropped out and I was working there and, um, and able to get my diploma once I got sober, <laughs> which they didn't really, I told the HR department I hadn't graduated, but um, nobody else really knew <laughs> in the lab I worked in. <laughs> So somehow I still got a job without a high school diploma. Wow. And, and then I was absolutely influenced to go into medicine while working there. And addiction medicine? No, I, was actually, I wanted to be a cardiac surgeon because I worked with, uh, in a cardiovascular research lab and the primary person who influenced me was a Brazilian cardiac surgeon. And he, he, we would uh, be doing surgery on these animals and he'd tell me all these stories of healing uh, from his work and just, I just want to be like Joao. <laughs> that, was my, that was my goal. <laughs> so I thought I'd be a cardiac surgeon. And then halfway through medical school back at Mayo, um, I still had that plan and I was doing clinical rotations and all these patients had alcoholism or other type of addiction. And I'd identify that and bring it up with my attending, the, the physician on staff and the residents, and they would listen to me and then tell me, we're not gonna do anything about that, Marv. And we didn't put it in the chart. We didn't refer people for care, for consultation, nothing. And it was often the cause of the hospitalization, but we were doing nothing about it. And I was complaining about this at AA, <laughs> a meeting I attended weekly and after a few weeks these two doctors in the meeting <laughs> took me aside one night and said, Marv, you have got to quit bitching about this and do something about it. <laughs> and, 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 and it kind of opened my eyes to possibility. Yeah. It, it was actually that discussion that s resulted in me going into psychiatry and folk, uh, specializing in addiction. Well, we're glad that you did. It's been <laughs> many too. decades now. It has, yeah. And did you ever think that the day would come when the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation would be collaborating with Mayo? Uh, you know, I didn't. I'd hoped so mm -hmm. all along, but it, it just didn't happen. It didn't happen, so I kind of lost hope about it. And now here we are doing it. Two studies. Tell us about them. Yeah, so we're doing uh, an NIH grant-funded study that, that we partnered with uh, Mayo Clinic on to study a medication for alcohol use disorders, uh, the medicines at Camp or SATE which hardly gets used because it only works for about 10% of people uh, with an alcohol use disorder. So for me as a doc, it's hard to convince myself to prescribe it to somebody and especially hard to convince them to take it because it works so infrequently, you know, and nine out of 10, it doesn't work for it. But there is always this um, underlying thought that it must be a, a genetic subtype of alcoholics mm. so that respond to it. So what we've decided with Mayo is to find out if that's true, because uh, one of the main researchers there, who I actually knew since I worked in that lab as a kid, huh. um, Dick Winchelbaum, he helped develop uh, technologies for examining uh, genetic and metabolic biomarkers, which are just kind of the whole human genome, kind of testing that to see if uh, an individual is gonna respond to medicine or not but also these metabolic biomarkers are just normal metabolic byproducts floating around in our blood. Mm -hmm. So we can take a simple blood test and check it out to see uh, who responds to the medicine and who doesn't. And as a result of determining that, we put it into artificial intelligence computers to, to examine the, uh, uh, the characteristics of those biomarkers and those who respond versus those who don't. 
And uh, he started with these studies with cancer chemotherapeutic agents. So now if you go to Mayo with certain cancers, they just take a blood test and they'll tell you, well, this is the one you should take. This is the medicine you should take because it'll work for you where this one won't which is a tremendous help in decision-making, really personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. And then he worked on some antidepressant medications in the same manner, same kind of biomarkers to, to simple blood tests to tell who responds and who doesn't, or who has side effects versus who doesn't. And, and he decided, you know, alcoholism is such a huge problem all around the world, it's the next place I want to spend my time, and so we're doing this study. And it will give uh, physicians and other prescribers, you know, the ability to meet somebody with an alcohol use disorder and determine if this medicine makes sense or not. And it'll be the first time that's a, that kind of decision making is available in the addiction field. How long is it going to take before the, we get some results? Probably another three to four years. It's a, it ta we're, we need 800 patients, patients with an alcohol use disorder, half of whom will get a placebo, half will get the real medication to be able to compare response rates and figure out who's who and, mm. and then using the artificial, intel artificial intelligence stuff too. There's another aspect to the study that's like science fiction. Tell us. So every patient that volunteers for this will have a little bit of their blood uh, shipped down to Mayo and a woman there will take certain cells, these that are called pluripotent stem cells. So you've heard of stem cells. Sure. Well, pluripotent stem cells can turn into any kind of cell. So she'll turn, it takes three months, but she'll turn them into neurons, so brain cells. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And <laughs> so, well, first she'll just take the regular cells, three months to turn into a pluripotent stem cell, three more months to turn into a neuron. So it's like she's growing these mini brains in a Petri dish in the Mayo Clinic. And, and then we can test to see if the medicine, as we're sure. doing these other, this yeah. other research, if it actually does really work on that person's uh -huh. brain cells without even being in touch with that individual, huh. which is really unusual and, and really fascinating. And uh, it's just been a treat to be involved and to learn about. Well, tell us about the other study. So the other study is basically the same kind of thing, only for opioid use disorders. And we got a grant from a Minnesota businessman. Uh, Mayo got the grant initially. He said he'll only give it in partnership with us, which was kind of nice, because uh, working together like this is working out really well. And uh, what we're doing is looking at naltrexone and buprenorphine, two of the three main medicines for opioid use disorder, and trying to find the same kind of biomarkers that will predict who responds the best to which medication. And right now, they both work. Um, they, they, you know, like any medicine, one's gonna work better for one person than another, but we have no clues, no predictors of any kind. So it's just, you know, it's a coin toss right now which medicine you give people. Um, we use certain characteristics to try to decide, but in general, we just don't have the information. And so after four or five more years and a lot of people, we're going to get the same kind of situation where a simple blood test will tell us which medicine will work for that individual. What's the ultimate goal with, with all of these kinds of studies? What, what do you as a doctor, but also you as a man in long-term recovery, what do you aspire to hope happens here? You know. The ideal is just better and better outcomes for people with uh, substance use disorders so that when they come into treatment, simple blood test defines which medicine would work for them and that will give them the best outcome of the medicines available. We add all the psychotherapies, you know, the 12-step facilitation therapy, get them involved in recovery-oriented uh, systems of care and peer support. and. If we do everything right, it's a lot more likely they're going to stay sober, and, and that's the goal. You know, increase the likelihood that people are sober. And they always talk about recovery being a program where strength in numbers matters, but in 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 the addiction treatment field and in the research field, strength in numbers through collaborations is important as well. It really is, because in this case with Mayo, they've got this tremendous genetics lab, you know, and all this. Uh, technology and all these people involved with other medicines long before they got involved in addiction. And it's kind of plug and play for them. They've done it before. This is just a different group of medicines and a different illness. And, and we've got all these patients with, with substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. 
so we kind of supply patients and the recovery, um, you know, treatment, uh, treatment programs, the, everything else they need, ongoing involvement. They supply the uh, manpower behind all that research. And then they use actually an artificial intelligence system from a university uh, in Indiana. So, hmm. so we've got three different systems involved, actually. Yeah. So science, medicine, collaboration, and so there's great hope on those, on those fronts for people who are struggling with addiction. There really are. And, and you know, the, the rates of uh, recovery are still, you know, basically on the low side. You know, when you look mm -hmm. at it compared to other yes. major illnesses. And so the better we can define who gets what medicine, the better we can define who gets what psychotherapy. You know, the more we do in that way, the better the outcomes will get. And that, that's, again, you know, the, the main goal. Hope. Yeah. Yeah, give people hope. Because, you know, right now when you talk to most people on the street, they, they say, well, addiction treatment doesn't really work, does right. it? You know, right. um, and so you give people hope they're more likely to seek treatment or they're mm -hmm. more likely to have their family members seek treatment mm -hmm. because it's, it's probably going to work. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a whole different mindset. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today and instilling uh, with our viewers and our listeners that sense of hope that, uh, that with innovation and collaboration and addiction treatment can come better outcomes and more people can recover. Well, thanks a lot, William. Glad to be here. Dr. Marvin Seppel, Chief Medical Officer of the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation, and our guest today on another edition of Let's Talk, a series of podcasts on the issues that matter to us, the issues that we know matter to you, too. Please, uh, if you like this program, please share it with your friends and collaborators, your colleagues, your uh, families, and let them know that uh, there is great hope to these series of podcasts. We hope you'll join us again. Thank you.